to an individual who has distinguished himself or herself in the course of a lifetime of service, which I think is a great thing. <laughs> the National Association of Personnel Service has also recognized Mike as the first winner of the American Idol of Recruiting Trainers. And as a business owner like yourself, Mike has been involved in seven startup operations, which has distinguished his career in staffing and re in, the, in the, excuse me, recruiting industry. Mike understands the challenges of finding great people, but also the pain of losing great individuals who are key to your organization. The selection and retention of key employers and employees at all levels has become the number one factor in obtaining a competitive advantage today. Success is in building high performance companies relies on the abilities not only to attract, but to retrain and also to turn loose those game changers. So we'd like to welcome Mike and give them a round of applause. Thank you. I'm trying to move this out of the way, prevent feedback from coming up. I, um, you know, after 30 years in the recruiting industry, I would hope that the most common question that would be asked of me had, would be something about my career, something about my experience in leading a business. And it's not. The biggest question that's always asked of me is, tell me about this American Idol thing that you won. <laughs> And it's true, I, I, I received a phone call from the chairman of the board of the National Association of Personnel Services saying we're gonna do an American Idol of Recruiting Trainer Contest in San Francisco. You should fly to San Francisco and enter this thing. Now keep in mind, I do not sing. I do not dance. 17 of us flew to San Francisco and competed in an all day event. And we had to give five talks in, in, in a day. And at the end of the evening, I was one of the four finalists. It was awesome. And said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to come and pick one of these magazines from this stand over here that are wrapped in four brown wrappers and go to your hotel room and come up with a talk. Now, for those of you who have a chance to do presentations, you, you know that doing a one hour, an hour and a half talk like I'm going to do today, it's not overly difficult because you don't have to be real tight. You know, you can kind of move around a little bit. You can play, but if you're going to do a six minute talk in a contest, it's got to be on target. It's got, you got to be on your game. Um, the first magazine that the guy picked I, unfortunately, I had to go last. I, I got the leftover. The first guy picked up Fortune magazine that was talking about this massive thing that was going on in, in the Asia Pacific area. You know, China was coming up, and you know, China's in this, this whole global economy. I'm going, I could have made something up with that. That'd have been great. I'm from Louisiana. I can make stuff up on anything. <laughs> the second one was USA Today, and it was the day that YouTube was purchased by, was it Google? Okay. YouTube was purchased by, and it's, I'm going, oh my God. This is gonna revolutionize the, the recruiting industry, inter, you know, video interviewing, and just think of the impact it's gonna have on all of us. Yeah, I didn't get that one. Um, the third one was Business Week that was talking about the impact of the weak educational system in the United States versus Asia. And I got the fourth. This proves to me that God has a sense of humor. <laughs> This was mine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I took this article, this magazine, and I ended up coming up with a presentation that had me being the last person standing, and I was recognized as the American Idol of Recruiters Trainers <laughs> by the National Association of Personnel Services. God has a sense of humor. <laughs> Let me tell you where the term game changers comes from. Uh, Tommy's sitting in the room, my wife, and I, you know how nervous I was? I was like this nervous compared to her. She kept walking around the hotel room going, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I, said, I have no idea, but somewhere in here there's an article, and it came out. So um, I have been blessed in being in the recruiting industry for, for 30 years now. Matter of fact, this is my 33rd year. Um, and the reason I got started on this subject was because I was hired by PricewaterhouseCoopers to conduct a search for him, to go and find an international tax accountant. Well, anybody in the accounting area knows that when you take the word international and tax and you put it together, this is a rare bird. 
Okay, it's a rare bird. This is this is I mean, this is a bear. I mean, they wanted somebody specifically with 5471 experience doing international tax computations for for uh, northern Africa. Uh, I mean, specifically targeted. The good news is, not only did I get the search, found the guy. I did. Found Paul. Found Paul. Paul was working at the time for Arthur Anderson. Paul was not only international tax specialist. But at four years, he had already received a master's degree, 4.0 grade point average, had passed his CPA exam in one sitting, which is like 3% of the people who do that, and ended up getting married and had a baby in the same year. If you look up Webster's, Paul's name is right next to multitasking, in my opinion. This guy was the epitome of multitasking. Paul started working for PricewaterhouseCoopers. And in 90, with this amazing background, 90 days later, Paul was terminated. The reason why is because Paul, when he started working there, failed to connect with the organization that he had been hired to go to work for. He failed to do the things that it takes to connect, to get off onto the right start. Our, my client failed to reach out and connect Paul to the organization. And as his consultant and the consultant of the client, I failed to guide and advise on the connection process that needs to take place for that successful talent to be released in a way to be productive to the organization. And it's haunted me. It's haunted me. So much so that I spend time looking at what, what causes this, this misfire. And today I want to spend some time talking about what do we need to do in order to, to make that happen. Now here's the challenge that we're going to wrestle with. Is that, um, well, I brought a tool along with us to try to help with it. In order for us to be successful, this afternoon, what we're going to have to be able to do is we're going to have to be able to use this. It's called a shoe sock. No, there's something inside the shoe sock. I'm from Louisiana. When I heard shoe and sock, and this, never mind, there's a long story with my dad on that one. So, anyway, any rate, uh, it's not a ping pong paddle. It's a mirror. In this particular area, the biggest challenge that we're going to face in the next hour and 20 minutes or so is our ability to look in the mirror. Because it's about us. It's about us who are trying to lead our organizations. And we're going to have to fight the battle of the three most dangerous words in the English language. I was talking to a young man who, who worked with me, he was our sales manager, Kevin, um, who, he was one of these young, you know, at the time single, you know, 20 something guys, you know, a little spiky hair, a uh, man about town. Uh, I was asking, I said, Kevin, what do you think the most three most dangerous words in the English language were. Kevin was, he's a real thoughtful guy. He kind of pondered for a minute and then he turned and looked up at me and goes, she's your daughter? <laughs> going, no, no, not that. Not, it's, I know that. I know that. And, and the reason why is it's what we carry into whatever situation we're working with it has a tendency to slow us down because we stop opening our minds up to the possibilities of what can be. And so I'm, I'm going to challenge, especially when it comes to hiring, because the people in this room are managers and owners. And we've hired people before, and so we have things that we do that, that kind of work for us. And there may be some things we looked at that we said, well, that doesn't work for me. The challenge we're going to have is we apply the principle of I know that to, to those circumstances. It makes the brain shrink. So I want to challenge us this afternoon to kind of throw those words aside and to make ourselves open to kind of taking a look at things. In order to do it, we're going to have to get outside of our comfort zone just a little bit, right? We're going to have to look and do something, maybe look at, 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 at our businesses and our teams and look at things that we're dealing with that, that may not be comfortable. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn to the person next to you at any point in time today and share something about your business that, that you don't want the general public to know about. So I want you to relax. There's nothing we're going to do today to embarrass you. 
maybe. Um, no, it, 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 this is something for us to just spend some time looking at. Um, it's an interesting slide. It's where some of this material came from, I have had an opportunity over the course of the next, the last two years, I'm working on doing research on a book that's called Game Changers. And I've had a chance to interview the CEOs and chairman of the board of these corporations, Anna Darko, BP, uh, Jamie Root from Houston, Texas. You'll hear me talk about some of these, uh, these people that I've talked to, to, to ask them the questions about when you're looking at selecting talent and bringing them on board, what are the issues that you deal with? What's worked for you? And what's been really cool is to see the similarities between the stories and examples that each one of these, these, these brilliant leaders have, have shared with me. Um, Harry Love, the chairman, I mean the, the global um, human resource director for Schlumberger, what was, he retired recently, shared this survey with me a few years back. And it's just as true today as it was then. These are the, the drivers that when we look at, at hiring top talent. What is it that the top performers want? What, what are the things that, that really uh, sort of inspire them or, or the driving mechanisms inside of them? So you'll see it's an opportunity to work for a strong executive team. Uh, feedback that helps employees to do their job better. Opportunity to work on things that, that they do best. It's being able to use those talents of things they do best. Managers who are knowledgeable about performance. Uh, internal communication within their organization. Employee understanding of performance standards. Emphasis on formal reviews or performance strengths, risk taking, and then fairness and accuracy of informal feedback. So here's my first question for the group this afternoon. You have nine things that we have up here that are the nine drivers of top performers, of the, the top quartile people as they're referred to. What do you see in there? What's what you say number one? Tell me about that. Small little instances that are taken and judged as an overall total performance. Okay, so small instances that are taken and judged as maybe overall total performance. Okay. Absolutely. What else? What else do you see? Other nine things. Anything else that sort of stands out in your mind? Yes. If, if this is a feedback of the high performers, mm -hmm. I'm kind of surprised that the first one was fairness and accuracy because they're usually like results oriented. They drive their own. Okay, so what you're saying is that you, the, the top performers, it's fair and accuracy, okay? You're surprised that that's actually the, the, the number one thing. Because they're usually self-driven and... So she's saying that she's surprised that number one... Why do you think that is? Why do you think number one, the fairness and accuracy and, and number one? Right, so you, you've got the, the number, the, your top quartile people are drivers, let's make something happen. What, if, you, if you take number one, and I can understand why that question would come up. It says, you know, it's like, is it fair? I'm, I'm the person, I'm the top producer, so I'm the person who's used to getting results, and I will make things happen. And we'll actually talk a little bit about that later on. But here, here's the underlying fact that you, when you take that, that premise, if you look at the nine things, five of the, the top nine, Five of the top nine have to do with communication. I mean, that when I looked at this and I sort of unpacked, it blew me up. Five of the top nine have to do with communication. Communication with me and the people above me, communication with my contemporaries. It's how, I'm, how you communicate with me as far as my value to the organization. And so we have to stop and think about that, that if our top performers, we need to be in overdrive in the way we communicate with them. Because those are the people we're building our organizations around. Those are the people that we're building our team around. That's a huge factor. The second observation I had was number two. The ability and, and the desire to take risk. And I found this to be true, especially not only talking to the CEOs. I mean, they, this was something they found that their top performers are people that are willing to kind of step out of their comfort zone a little bit. They're, they're willing to take risk. And I think that, that we need to recognize that our top performers, this is a driving force that's inside of them. Even if you think of people who are your non-risk takers. I spoke recently to the Institute of Management Accountants. Not exactly the biggest risk takers in the world. I mean, I'm not sure I want our CPA to be taking risk with our books. All right. However, 
The mechanism that it's inside of them that makes them good, the top performers, is they're going to be willing to stretch themselves. They're going to be willing to push themselves into something new. They're not going to be willing to stay with the status quo, not the top performers. It's the desire and the ability to take risk is really what helps them become who they are. This was driven home to me as a freshman in high school. I come from a very sports-oriented family. Uh, my father, uh, Joe, uh, is from the bayous of South Louisiana. It comes from Hathaway, Louisiana. I call it kind of bump on the side of the bayou. Uh, it, it's a small town. My father was uh, an outstanding basketball player, track star. So he held the, the record in hurdles uh, until the late 1950s. Uh, it was a fast pitch softball pitcher until he was 46 years old. And my brother Wendell was a quarterback of the McNeese State football team, uh, was a state champion javelin thrower. I mean, sports was part of my heritage. That's where I came from. I decided as a freshman in high school that I wanted to try out for the varsity basketball team. Now, to put this in perspective, you need to know two things. The first is, only one other person had ever made the varsity basketball team as a freshman in 25 years. You know, I went to a very small, small private Catholic high school in South Louisiana. The second piece you need to understand is between my eighth grade year and my ninth grade year, I grew nine inches. I see the mothers in the room, oh. All right. I mean, it's, my, my dad referred to the year as the year of no television. And the reason why is they used to just put me on the couch and they would just watch the pants like kind of crawl up, <laughs> up my, my leg. Or my, my daughter, Nikki, saw a picture of me as a freshman. And I mean, I was so skinny. I was like an Adam's apple with rib cage wrapped around it. <laughs> Nikki said, Daddy, if you would turn sideways and stick your tongue out, you'd look like a zipper. I mean, I, mean, I am like real thin. Here's the cool thing. Made the team. Made the team. And unfortunately, by the end of the season, I was the only one on the team to not score a basket the entire year. So the coach decided with 27 seconds to go in the last game of the season to call timeout. And I still remember, I'm sitting down on the end of the bench over here, just waiting for this thing to end because, I mean, look, I was so bored. I mean, I had brought a little TV in, had a little magazine rack. I mean, it, he wasn't calling me into the game. It was kind of just anything to pacify my life. And I hear this voice coming from the other end of the bench, and I hear, John! I go walking down to him, and he reaches over and he grabs me by my warm-up, and he goes, Bleh! pops the snaps right off the front of it. Grabs my jersey and kind of rolls it up like this so he can cool me close to him. He said, you're going to go in the game. You're going to stand at half court. Big Ronald Malvo is going to jump up in the air, grab a basket, a rebound. He's going to throw it down to you at half court. You're going to dribble the ball down to our end of the goal. You're going to shoot a layup, which is the easiest shot in basketball. You're going to score a point. You understand that? I still remember this day vividly because, I mean, the, the crowd kind of got into this. They kind of knew you know, something was going on. Because you got to understand, let me tell you what the gym looked like. This gymnasium that I'm in is about 50 years old. And it, it, small thing. It, the bleachers on this side had two rows of bleachers over here. This side, you had three rows on this end. Behind us was the student section, went up into the rafters. And on this side, there was no bleachers. There was just a wall with doors that were chained shut, you know, for safety purposes. I'm not sure about that, okay? Oh, they protected us. They put a mattress in front of it and chained it, but that's okay. Uh, and there's no air conditioning in the place. There's just a row of windows across the top of the, 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 the gymnasium, you know, propped open. Hang on a second. There you go. And, uh, and it's, I'm standing at half court, and, but it's like I'm, I'm in this gym. And have you ever been in these small town gymnasium, small gym? It's like, it's got its own smell, I mean, and you can hear the people, and they're going crazy. And the play comes off just like the coach designed it. Big Ronald jumps up in the air. The guy shoots a, 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 free, throw, a, a free throw, misses it, jumps up, Ronald jumps up, gets the rebound. He catches it, and he throws it down to me at half court. And it's one of those poignant moments in life. You know what they are. It's like time stands still. 
Almost, or, you know, it's almost like you can hear music, right? I started dribbling down the, the, the court just as fast as I can. I mean, I'm flying down the court. I'm flying there just like, just, just like, like Michael, Michael Jordan, or maybe, maybe like Kobe Bryant. Probably more like a giraffe in heat. But I am flying down that court. I hit that free throw line. I jump up, the other ball goes out of my hand. It goes over the goal. It goes over the backboard and out the window. Not exactly the greatest moment in my life. The crowd is going nuts. I mean, the, the coach is laying down on the bench with his hands around his throat yelling, joke. You're probably wondering, why is he telling me this story? <laughs> that summer, I had to make a decision on what I was going to do. What do I do? And, and what happens is, when we hit these moments in life, you know, these, these like Rob Pennington was talking about this morning, these stressful crosshairs. Um, I believe that God puts people in our lives. So, you know, these, these wise sages, these Yodas. Mine was Glenn. He was an older man. He was a senior. But he called me up. He said, come over to the gym with me. And he and I practiced shot after shot, layup after layup after layup after layup. We practiced so much that summer that by the time the fall came around in my sophomore year, I made the basketball team. And not only did I make the basketball team, but I became a starter. And before I finished my, college, my high school career, I had three colleges looking at me to play college basketball and scored 27 points in a game in South Cameron, Louisiana. And I can still remember the look on my mother and father's face as they're sitting down at the end of the bleachers with the pride that they looked. Now, Dad was probably a little embarrassed because I think he talked to the custodian and told him to close the windows before the game started, but that's beside <laughs> the point or whatever. The reason I'm sharing this story with you is that what happens is when we step into that place of risk and fear, that's where our growth comes from. And the top performers know that. And we have to give them opportunities to go and shoot those layups. We have to give them the opportunity to stretch themselves and not do well. We have to be able to convey to them that we recognize the talent that's inside them. And that's the mission that we're on. And so today, we're going to spend some time talking about you know, key contributors that, that, cause, uh, that, that, that cause the turnover when we lose these people. You know, it's do, you know, it's do they contribute? These are the motivators. You know, do they feel a sense of independence? Do they feel productive? Do they feel a sense of accomplishment in what they're doing? And if we don't create that type of environment, we are asking for turnover to exist in our companies. Tom Winninger uh, is, is a, uh, an international consultant. And this is one of my favorite quotes I've run into, all right? because it's the energy that resides inside of the people is where the future of where our companies exist. It's the energy that lies inside of our top talent. And the challenge we have as owners and leaders of businesses, we have to do something to locate people who have that energy inside of them, and then we have to find ways to get that energy out of them. That's where the future of our companies reside. And so I've come up with something. It's, it's a simple formula. I call it the connectivity formula. All right? And it's, what it simply means is this. It's if you take selection and then you take onboarding, getting them involved in, once we've hired them, getting them in, uh, started in our organization, and then as leaders finding ways to engage them, what we end up with that is we end up with performance squared, not just somebody who's doing their job. And I believe that right now, for us to have competitive advantage in our markets, in today's marketplace, we need performance squared. We need to be getting more done with less people. We need to make sure the talent that we have are operating at optimum capacity. And if we don't, we open the windows for our, our competition to come in and be able to take business away from us. So let's talk about selection. I used to think of selection as, 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 as intuition. Right? Intuition. I think as leaders, that's one of the things that, that we're called on there, to have intuition, be intuitive about the people that we ask to come to work for us. But when I looked at this, it's like the word intuition. I used to think of it as, is it like some kind of crystal ball? Or is it, kind of, kind of, is it a Ouija board or something that tells us, ooh, the magic dust. This is who the person really is. 
And really, when you look at it, intuition is this. If you look at it, and according to Webster's, it's simply this. It's a quick, keen and quick insight. A keen and quick insight. And what we need to do in our selection process is have as many resources as we can to increase our keen and quick insight. So we can, we can make a better both selection process and do a better job of hooking that person we want to be able to bring them on board. So let's kind of look at some of the tools that we need, that we need to be able to, to implement. The first one is in the interview process is making sure that, that our hiring success centers our ability to ask questions. Uh, when I started first playing around with this, I started thinking, well, you know, gosh, why should you teach people about, talk to people about asking questions? Isn't that what an interview is about? I have found in the clients that I've worked with over the past three decades, matter of fact, somebody on my staff reminded me the other day, Mike, if you're 33 years in the business, you're in your fourth decade. I said, you don't work with me anymore. No. Um, it, it's, I have found we struggle with this as, as, as owners and managers when we're trying to hire people. It's the questions we ask. The first one is, do we ask questions that focus on past behavior, or are we simply trying to verify skill? What's the difference in that? Focus on past behavior versus verifying skill. I'll ask this side of the room. <laughs> yeah, okay. what, what's, what's the difference? Yes? Well, attitude. You're, you're trying to get a perspective on your attitude. I like that. So you, yeah, there's an attitude quote, quote, a quotient that's involved that skill alone doesn't have, right? Yeah. Okay. I like that. What else? Uh, history tells you a lot about it. Why is that? That sounds like a simple thing, but why is that? It, it's the mistakes that I have made. I, you know, yeah, look, I think I'm a pretty good manager. Kind of biased on that subject. I'm not going to poll. I think I'm a pretty good manager. The challenge I fight with myself is that I will interview somebody and they will tell me about working for another manager and I will think, my environment is different than that. I'm a better manager than that. And so what I will do is I will hire that individual and bring them into my organization expecting to get different results. But their past says that this is a past, this is a trend. And so the past behavior has a tendency to dictate what the future might look like. And so I think it's very important for us to take a look at it. Right, is that looking at, at, at what's their past, and it's, it's behavioral style interviewing questions. Now, let me just touch on this, because we're not going to spend the afternoon talking about behavioral style interviewing. It's the, the, what we have to be able to do is to really hone our ability to ask questions to see what was it that they did in their past, what was their behavior in certain circumstances, in certain uh, situations that they're involved with, that fit in line with what you need uh, for them to do and in the situation circumstances that you're dealing with, such as if you're looking for somebody who has the ability to deal with deadlines, what are the questions that we would ask about that? Have you, have you, well, have you, uh, you know, but, but it's, it, I'm sorry, say that question again? Okay, let's take it, let, 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 she said, can you, can you work under pressure? Here's the, it, it, we need to edit the, the, a little bit. You're going in the right direction. It's not, can you, where, not will you, where have you? That's the behavior style. Here's the problem is, is that I interview people and they say, can you work? Oh, well, by gosh, yes, I love pressure, okay? And we have a, we, I, I'm being stimulated by that. But there's nothing in their background that shows me that they will work under pressure. They can't, they can't verbalize. Our job is to be able to ferret through the people we're talking to to find the people that have been in situations where they've had to deal with the same type of circumstance and the same type of environmental issues that we're dealing with, right? So does that make sense? So that's from a behavioral type of thing, all right? Now, the second one is, do we listen for what we want to hear? <sighs> that's my biggest problem. I have a tendency to hear what I want to hear. I interviewed a young lady. Uh, we're a sales-oriented organization. Right? We, we are in the executive search field. We have a software company. We do contract and temporary staffing. Um, and so we're very business development oriented and pretty much in all facets of our company. I interviewed a young lady who was explaining to me about the great um, fundraising campaign that she had participated in at Sam Houston University, Sam Houston State. When she was involved with the, the sorority that she was involved with led the nation 
with this fundraising drive. It was a, the more she described it, it was amazing. I'm going, oh my gosh. I mean, this, this, she's going to be able to come on board and just do, um, I mean, she'll set company gold and records for us. Well, she came, I heard her, she came to work. And three weeks into it, I'm going, what happened? So we, we, she, she, had a, she didn't have the ability to pick up the phone and speak to people. She was very insecure. I'm going, but what happened to this fundraising thing? When we sat down and talked about we needed, you know, she needed to go in a different direction. She was just not working out. And when we were doing the exit interview, I went back to that same situation and found that, yes, her sorority had been involved in that. And she said, we were doing that. I made the mistake of not asking, what was your role in that process? I heard what I wanted to hear. And I found that that she was the record keeper on the team, not the lead dog. And I had a different picture. Whose fault was it? Was it hers? Nah. I heard what I wanted to hear. I heard what I wanted to hear. Do we ask enough questions about character? Um, this is one of the most important things I think we could look at. It's, it's, um, I spoke to Eligio Serrano, who is the chief financial officer for uh, uh, Universal Pegasus. And I was, it, 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 I've known him for a number of years. Came out of the Schlumberger organization also. Just uh, was with Eagle Global Logistics, uh, another uh, uh, the seismic company, Paradigm. And he, his gift is going to process changes. I mean, global, massive stuff. And I was asking him about multicultural situations. It's, it's, he's had an opportunity to, enter, to work with people from around the world, from a lot of different ethnic backgrounds and, and nationalities. And I ask him, he says, does things change if you're looking for somebody in, in different circumstances in, 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 uh, uh, in different places around the, country, around, the United, around the world? And he said, character transcends all backgrounds and experiences <coughs> as long as it's a part of who that person is. And so our quest is to be able to go and try to figure out what is the character of the person that we're trying to hire? So here's what I want to do, is I'm only going to take about three and a half, maybe three minutes and 47 seconds. I haven't decided yet. Um, but I'd like to, at the table that you're at right now, is that just take a couple minutes and talk about in the organizations that you're responsible for leading, when you think of the word character, what is it, what are the character traits that you think you need to be looking for and the people that you might ask to come on board? And will it differ from one job to another, one role to another? Does that make sense? Do you understand the question? What's the character or the character traits of the person that you might, might need to add to your organization? And would it differ from one role to another? All right? And so, yeah, we'll, we'll do the three minutes and 47 seconds. OK, go ahead. Okay, see if I can pull everybody back together again after releasing the quail. Shh. By the way, that doesn't work on teenagers, I just want to tell you that. Okay, so what do we come up with? What are the character traits? Self-performer. So a self-performer, emphasis on the word self. Yes. Okay, self-performer. Okay, what else? Versatility. Versatility. Okay, so this is somebody that's a versatility, somebody who has the ability to do what? Is this skill? Uh, I would say so. Of, yeah. You to, have to have a to, certain ability of adaptability. To, to, to some extent, it, it's skill, and then there's, you know, there's some training, obviously, that needs to be involved. Okay. So there's, there's skill, there's training, all right, and there's another key component that sits inside of that, and that's attitude. 
Okay, the ad, and that's a lot of times what happens is we find the person who has the ability technically to do it, but they don't have the, there, there's an, an attitude part that we fail to kind of peel into in, in our interviewing process to unfold that, to find out where, where that, that flexible mind comes from, come into play, all right? So it's a good point. What else? What other character? Accountability. Accountability. And stick that word kind of self. Is there a self-accountability that goes with it? It's very good. What else? Multitask, the ability to, who has a, the mentally has the ability to be able to drive from one thing to the other. Honesty, okay? There's an honesty or integrity part of it comes into play, right? Anything else? Passion. Passion, right? And we're, I'm, I'm actually going to talk a little bit later on about passion, about some things in that area. What else? Hard, the, the industrious, again, we we'll be able to drive. Here's some of the things you looked at, okay? Isn't it interesting, okay? Right? I don't have a Ouija board, okay? These are the things that are important to us as business leaders and business owners. But what we have to be able to do is we have to be able to look at our interviewing questions to uncover these. So let's kind of take a look at what some of those may look like. Oh, hang on a second, we'll stay here for a second. Um, how do we go about going in and looking at these, all right, to find that is a part of somebody's character? I was talking to Jamie Root, president of Houston Texans. They built a, an amazing, amazing organization. Right? I, I, I'm blown away. And it's, I, I, yes, I do like football, but what, in, in, what really intrigues me about the Texans is that how old are they now? Eight eight, about eight, eight, nine years old, something like that. All right? Anybody remember how much they paid for the right to be called the Texans as a franchise? $750 million just for the right to have an NFL franchise. Okay? They are now one of the seventh most valued uh, brands in the world in all sports. Right? Eight years. Eight years. Because they have collected a group of people that are just... Uh, that are more than just football players on the field. It's about their organization. It's about what they do. Jamie was asked, said, how do you select people? He said, I want to find out about their character. So what I will do is I will ask questions. Give me an example. You remember we talked about the behavioral style? Here's, here's the, the, the goal that comes out of this. Give me an example in the past where you've had to deal with deadlines. And then they will explain, well, in my last role, it's because of it being in the accounting area. I've had the annual reports that have to be done on a you know, by the first quarter of every year, da da da. He said, oh, super, super. Give me another example. He said, I will ask three times. I want to see, is that a part of who that, of, of, of the person's character, or is it simply a skill that they possess that they used at one point in time? Change the way I interview now. I want to go in, I'm looking for multiple, multiple situations. All right? Piece of gold. The second is that it doesn't matter what role that we're trying to fill. A lot of times, don't we need to find people who have the ability to deal with sort of self-accountability and ability to deal with diverse, uh, 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 difficult situations, adverse situations? Uh, I got to give Tommy, uh, who is uh, uh, my business partner as well as my wife. Uh, I've learned so much from watching her. And one of the first things that she taught me was a question that I can't ask because it's her favorite question. So I'm telling you ahead of this time, in case you ever interview another company, you're going to be asked this question. Uh, but it's, it really is very powerful. And the question is this, is it give me, and where in your past have you had to deal with, excuse me, back up on this. The way the question is, what has been the most difficult situation uh, that you've had to deal with in your life, either personally or professionally? What is the most difficult situation that you've had to deal with in your past? And what we're looking for is somebody who had to overcome some type of challenge in their life. And it doesn't matter if we're hiring at our front desk, in sales, in accounting. I want somebody who's had to deal with something that they've had to resolve and work their way through. Now, she asked that question one day to a young lady. He said, what's the most difficult situation you've had to deal with? And she said, you will not believe this. I, I, don't, I, she, I don't know why people cry in her office. They, they do. They just always do. I don't know what to understand. She goes, when I was in college, my father took away my credit card. <laughs> we didn't hire her. <laughs> you're looking for somebody who's had to deal with something in their life. That's what you're looking for. All right? Now, 
Danny Cahill, which you may not, you probably don't know that name. He is considered to be one of the, 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 the not one of, he is the number one trainer in the recruiting industry across the United States. Um, I had a chance to interview him and talk to him about this question. He said that the magic behind this has to do with the follow-up question. How long did it take you to deal with that? And his example was, if I've interviewed somebody and we've had people talk about, you know, they went through a, a divorce. Or I remember a, a young man who was just, uh, he was crushed when his grandmother passed away because his grandmother raised him. Well, what you're looking for is the person who says, you know, it's, it was a struggle for me for the first six to nine months, maybe a year or something. What you want to stay away from is the person who tells you about the five years that they were dealing with counseling and circumstance. And, and, there is, and it's not that there's something wrong with that. Because different people, it's going to take them a while to deal. What happens is you want that person who deals with an adverse situation and has the resilience to be able to move through it and move through it in whatever you consider to be a timely basis. That's the type of people that we need to surround ourselves with. These are the type of people that are game changers, whether it be somebody doing data entry or somebody who is leading a sales initiative for your organization. You're looking for that person who has that internal resolve, that internal push, that internal drive that helps them deal with circumstances and, and situations. Okay, enough on that one. Can they navigate? Um, this is a gem. I, I had an, uh, an opportunity to um, speak to Judd Grady, who is the Chief Financial Officer of Seismic Exchange Corporation. And uh, Judd's an amazing man. He comes from New Orleans, was one of the youngest partners in Arthur Anderson uh, before he left there to go to work with Seismic Exchange, uh, leading their, their financial operation. And his most amazing interpersonal leadership skills. And he was talking about that the selection process, when we're looking for people to join our organization, we need to find people who have the ability to navigate. And what he means by this is that when a problem or when a project comes up that somebody has to deal with, there's always circumstances around it that don't go well. And what you're looking for are people who in their past have showed examples of how, you know, of, of where do I go to get the answer that I need to resolve the problem at hand? When you're looking for people on your team right now that you want to move into key areas of responsibility, look for people in your organization, no matter how small it is. Do they have the ability to navigate to help resolve the problems or the issues to be able to make things happen that they want to? It's the ability to navigate circumstances and situations as the people that we need to be building our organizations around and we need to be asking questions about them. Do we utilize assessments in our selection process? Uh, do a quick survey. How many people use some form of assessment uh, in selecting people? Handful. Let me take just a minute and, and talk about this. Uh, and I have to fess up on myself a little bit. Uh, I went to work with Steverson and Company 20 years ago in November. And one of the first things Tommy wanted me to do was to take a personality profile, an assessment. And I was supposed to do it before I accepted the offer and before we moved forward. And uh, I don't remember how I did it, but somehow I skirted and didn't do it. All right. And uh, for the next year, she kept saying, you need to take this assessment. And I didn't want to because I didn't believe that I could fill out a piece of paper and it could kind of tell me anything about me. It's just some computer generated stuff. Uh, finally, she sat me down one day and she handed me this thing. She goes, you will fill this out before you leave my office if you'd like to work here. I went, okay. <laughs> fill this. And, and by that time, I was afraid to fill it out because I was afraid she was going to find something out about me and she would fire me and, because there would be something that would be unveiled. Here's what I, I, I read this thing and it was like going, it really did an accurate job of describing the drivers inside of me. And that's what a, an assessment does. It gives you the ability to be able to look, and I'm a pretty decent interviewer, but we won't hire anybody without taking them through some time. And there's a number of assessments out there. There's Berkman, there's Myers-Briggs, there's uh, uh, one that we use called Omnia, we use a second one called uh, tri uh, TTI Trimetrics. There's a number of them out there. Uh, 
And it's, the reason I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about it is I highly recommend that you look into this as part of your, not just your selection process, but your leadership building process. In other words, as far as people working within your organization, it helps you to, un and it helps them to understand more about who they are and their communication style and the drivers that are inside of them so that the two of you can communicate better because your way of interacting with them will be different than their way of interacting with you. And so these assessments really are, are, are a huge tool. Uh, if anybody has any interest, there's a, a, I've got a, a, a jar over there. If you want to get some information from me, throw a card in there. I'll let you know about some of the stuff that, that we've done and that we use along those lines and, and, and try to help with that. But it's, I highly recommend spend some time looking at this because it provides information to help us make better decisions on the type of people that fit our organization, our management style, and the role that we're asking them to do. It's a very, very, very important role with it. So the other thing about the, um, no, it's enough on assessments. Anybody have any questions about that? Yes. Um, in order to do that, though, don't you need to do those same assessments on your leadership team in order to say, okay, this is what we currently have in place. Cor this correct. Is You're right. In other words, if I'm hiring somebody, the, there's two things I need to do. Is I have to do my own assessment of myself. And the reason why is because the information that you'll get back from the assessments will talk about how that person will interact with you. And your, in other words, I have a fairly hands-off management style. I am not a driver micromanager, in spite of what my employees know. I, it's, I mean, they, they will tell you, that's, that's not me, all right? I mean, I hold them accountable, but I'm not the guy who's every day kind of upon. So the person who needs that in, in their mechanism won't work well with me, right? The person who needs that. If somebody is a micromanager, somebody who is like the driver on top of it, the person who is that high level of independence won't work well with that individual. And that's a good example. I'm glad you had, that's a good example of why the assessments work, is it gives you an understanding of the person's internal drivers, the type of environmental area that they need to, to, to work in that will help them to respond best. So that, uh, again, you can make the right decision of putting people in, in the right roles. Any other questions about that? Okay. Hire a painter. You were talking about passion. Uh, LaRue Coleman is a name that you don't know, probably, my guess. Uh, I was introduced to him, and I'm so glad. He, he, at, at, at 18 years old, LaRue dropped out of school, out of, out of college, because he didn't have any funds, and went to work with a, a, a window washing company. This guy owned a window washing contract. And in five years, he bought the guy out. 23 years old, bought the guy out. Took over the company. Uh, today, the company that LaRue Coleman is the president of is responsible for washing 90% of all the windows in downtown Houston. And at one point in time, had that same market share in five major cities around the country until he decided to consolidate down for quality of life issues. Average tenure of his leadership team is 30 years. It's amazing. I see your head nodding. It's just, it's amazing, amazing guy. I was talking to him about a couple of things, and one of the first things that he shared with me, he said, he said when you hire somebody, you want, you, want to, you want to hire a painter. And I looked at him and went, Okay. <laughs> he said there's a guy on his staff who walked in his office one day with a book. And he said, Uru, you got to read this book. And it was The History of Paint. And he looked at him and went, Yeah, okay. And this guy went on to talk about the fascination that he had about the history of work. And what LaRue is trying to get me to understand is that you hire people that have a passion for whatever it is they're involved with. We're working on a search right now for one of our clients. The CIO challenged us with hiring people that were basically an IT painter. Somebody who, when they're at home at night, what they do is they think about IT systems and structures. And I'm not talking about the person who is uh, an overworked, never shut down zealot. I'm talking about the person that when you ask them, do you put any overtime in, they say no, because it's not overtime. It's just who they are. It's what they do. It's a part of who they are. 
It's that character that Jamie was talking about. It's innate inside of them. So when we're looking for people within our organizations, we need to find people who have that type of, 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 of mindset behind what they do. Now the challenge we have, as I was listening to some of the conversations, is in today's marketplace, is how easy is that to find? It's not. It's hard. It's tough. But I think we need to set that as a goal to look for people as we're going through the interview process and not be expedient in just hiring skill. Because if we slow ourselves down, I heard people talk about training and guiding. You can take and you can bend somebody who has the right attitude who thinks like a painter. Because in LaRue's company now, they don't just wash windows. They design the interior of elevators for high-rise buildings. We're talking marble and all these amazing facades. I mean, they morphed and all this because they hire people who think and dream and, and, and put their heart and soul in what they're doing. This is the task we're on. Yes? So how, are there certain questions that you ask in order to kind of pull that out of people? Or are there other things that, I mean, you can't just say, are you, are you passionate about can't. writing? No. Okay, so uh, let, let, me, let me go to, uh, and I'm, I'm throwing other names in here because this, this, to let you know, this is not something I said at my desk one day. It's, I've been on a quest on this subject. I had a chance to interview Jim Hackett from Anadarko Petroleum. Phenomenal, phenomenal guy. He's uh, just stepped down and is retired at a very early age uh, after just guiding them through some massive things. And it's, it, what he was talking about as far as the interview process has to do with talk to people about where do they spend their time outside of work. Let's kind of talk about that for a minute, okay? Is that, and and let, me, let me do two things. Let me, do, let me take him and let me take Mike Richter. I'm having fun with this. I'm thinking back on all these interviews I've been having. Mike Richter is one of the managing directors of UHY, which is one of the largest uh, CPA firms in the country. Uh, Mike and, 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 and I just, I just dawned on me, Mike and Jim are talking about the same thing. Mike Richter told me as a, a CPA firm that they, what he looks for is he wants to hire dreamers. And I'm going, an accountant who's a dreamer. Tell me, and, and I'm, not, I'm not demeaning accountants when I say that, but I mean, it's, it, you don't think of that. You think of detail-oriented and, and accuracy. He said, because what I want is I want the person who's passionate about something. Because if they're passionate about something, that's going to transcend into the way that they're going to live their life and their job and what they're involved. The person who doesn't have dreams and doesn't have passion, you can't move them toward anything. Right? They're not going to get excited about something. They're going to be the person who's going to be the naysayer and the complainer and seeing life and the challenges. We have no clients, right? I'm, ta I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you that the city of Houston's in economic turmoil right now because that's not what we see. We see company after company doing some exciting things out there. You don't see that on the news, you don't see it on the internet, but I'm telling you, Houston's percolating. Things are, there's some cool things that are taking place. You gotta go find them, they're not walking in your door. And so what you're looking at when you're interviewing people, you're asking questions about what do they do? Asking questions about, and again, there's a line you have to watch out because you, know, you can't ask about kids and husbands and wives, but you can throw things out to try to see how does somebody maybe start talking about their family? Because somebody who interacts and talks about family involvement and things they're involved with has a tendency to be someone who's a little bit more social oriented, and so you look for those types of things. Uh, you look for examples of maybe a question might be, can you tell me of, a, of something you've been involved with in the past that was a cause that you went and fought for? that you believed in. You're trying to find something about that, that, that internal drive. If you're looking for something that's job specific, tell me about in the last two jobs that you had, what was a project that you personally asked to take on yourself? Are you asked to get involved with? That may be a question that will help you find out what's, is there a painter sitting in here somewhere? Anybody else have any, is this stimulating any thoughts of anybody else might have that, uh, to answer that question? It's a great question. Yes. Uh, I have a PR agency and I ask people what their dream client would be. Mm. And so that's a way you can find out about their personal life without asking about their personal life and you can see if they actually get excited about what they're talking about. And I think it's something you can just tell by the way they answer certain questions. It's mm -hmm. not even a question that you can ask. It's just like the general mood in the room that you're talking to them. Are they excited to be there, sitting there, or is it just a job interview? Mm. So I guess what I'm hearing out of this also is that there's not one question that's going to be the magic answer that says that the answer to this question this way is pass or fail. It's trying to find ways in the question. We spent a lot of time on this, but that's the way I've looked at it over the years. It's a tough 
thing to be able to guide. And we need as many resources. We have. Let, me, uh, let me share with you a couple of other ideas that you can have to ferret this out. Don't interview the person in the same place in the same room more than once. So in other words, if I'm bringing somebody to interview, I'm going to interview them and we have an interviewing room. But if I'm considering them from internal, I'm going to move them into the conference room. I will interview them at lunch. I will interview them over the telephone. I want to see that person in three or four different settings. And you don't have to take them outside the building, but it's, you want to change them from one environment to another to kind of see what does that do to them, all right? And can they hold on for more than, than, than a 30-minute period of time to be able to, um, be able to sell you the way that you want to, all right? That's our selection process as far as trying to find and, and look. But here's the mistake we make. We go out and we spend all this time getting the right individual. And then they show up to work and they walk in their first day and you're going, oh, Sally, you're here? Okay, there's your desk. I'll get with you in a little bit. I'm, I'm in a meeting. Welcome on board. Good seeing you. All right. Spent all this time going through this selection and dating kind of process. And they show up to work the first day and we aren't even ready for them. We aren't sending the right message. And so it's, it, we have to look at how do we get them in the word onboarding, how do we get them on board with our organization? Um, the first one is, it's critical, again, going back to LaRue, is don't delegate work to somebody when you bring them on board. Engage them. Engage them into whatever cause, whatever uh, role that you want them to do. And part of that has to do with this four steps. The first one, he says, you've got to challenge them with responsibility from the day they walk in the door. Challenge them with responsibility. Your top performers want responsibility. Challenge them with it. Evaluate the plan that you have in place for them to be able to accomplish whatever it is that you want them to do. The third step is then assess the development as they're going through those stages. And this doesn't have to be a one-month period of time. They come on board and they're doing a simple task for you, a simple role is that you engage them, you assess, you, 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 here's the plan, make sure they understand, you assess the development, and then follow through to make sure that you're following through the results that you're after. What happens is we get caught up because of our role and we've got a toe in one hole, and we're trying to keep the dike going, you know, plugging up all the holes, and we have a new person on board, we get them started on something and we don't help them to be able to move through those early steps, and when you do that, they don't get off on the right foot. And that causes turnover. And more importantly, it causes disengagement. And once somebody becomes disengaged from the organization, it's a bear to re-engage. So we have to make sure we take them through a process of doing that. When we bring them on board, do we make them earn our attention? I've got a friend of mine who owns a recruiting firm that puts somebody at the desk, and he and I are, are exactly bipolar on this subject. Because what he does is he puts them at a desk and he puts them on the telephone and if they can handle making the phone calls they need to make for the first two weeks, then he stops what he's doing and he spends time training them. He tells me it works for him. Here's my problem with that, is that I'm telling you, you're going to have to earn my attention. You're going to have to earn my time. You have to show me that you're worth me. And I'm telling you, the size of organizations we run, we don't have that luxury with the top performers. Top performers want to, want to be brought on board and we, they want to know that they're important to us and they need our attention. Second is that, can you get them involved in projects or just tasks? Big, big, big mistake. Big mistake that we get involved with. Is that we can get people on board and we say, here, go do this. But there's not a whole lot of meaning to it. I'll give you an example. Um, we have a fund committee in our company, fund committee. We have a couple people are responsible for just creating an atmosphere. Do you know who the leader of the fund committee is? It's our payroll person. She's a payroll accountant. Her job is to go back there and tick and tie numbers and make sure it's accuracy, and she's in charge. Not only is she in charge with that, but we started writing blogs. You know what our, who one of our top blog writers is about finding work? It's our payroll person, because she's an amazing writer. She got involved with things. How hooked do you think she is to organization? She's a part of the fabric of who we are because she's involved with things. See, what happens is we run into challenges. We look at people and we say, well, you're not ready because you don't. It's, this was taught to me. Okay, I'll tell you how long I've been doing this business. In the last year, 
I was taken to school again. Is that we had somebody, we had hired and brought a, a couple, a, a two new people on board. I was tied up because I was going to be out of town uh, in meetings. The other two people, our leadership team, were responsible for training on our computer system and on, uh, excuse me, training on our interview process were tied up. And Katie Thomas, our operations manager, came to me and says that we're going to have our, one of our new people teach our interviewing process. And I'm going, can't be done. They're new. How are they going to be able to tell me? Guess what? He knocked it out of the park. He did an amazing job with it. I almost robbed him of that opportunity because I wasn't willing to let him engage, wasn't willing to go and stretch. We need to watch ourselves as managers, as leaders. We sometimes look at situations saying that it has to have my magic stamp of approval. And there's a difference between perfect and good enough. What happens is we put perfection in our head because we think that's how we are, and we aren't. Hey, pop your bubble, okay. Uh, well, y'all are, well, I'm not, okay. But the problem is, is that we have to be able to do an evaluation of is what we're asking somebody, are they doing good enough to keep moving forward? And that's a key component. And what fits into this is do we spend time explaining what we want somebody to do, how we want to do it, or most importantly, do we spend time teaching them why we wanted them to do it? Now, here's my question to the group, since y'all are so responsive, I love this. Why is it important for us to explain why we want them to do it? I don't know the why, I don't care. Ah, I don't know the why, I don't care. Love that answer. Yes? They need to understand the purpose of what they're doing, all right? It's the learning style that they're being taught today in today's educational system. It's the learning style of today's educational system. If, if, if what she's saying is that if I don't know why, all right, then what happens, I, I won't have the ability to maybe give back in the form of doing process improvement or what have you. Critical observations. Critical observations. I mean, all these things are, I mean, bullseye right on target. It's what I've learned, again, in the last year uh, as a teacher, as a trainer, is that I have to spend, how much time have we spent talking about why we do things so far as much as the how? We just spend about 75% of our time talking about why we do things because it makes the how easier to be understood. It gets the commitment and the buy-in and the tie-in as, you're, as you're, all of you are pointing out so, so accurately. That's where the person gets engaged and gets, I mean, if, if somebody, if you're asking somebody to do data entry, it's a totally different process than if you said, let me explain to you the importance of the records we're trying to keep and what's involved with. Let me tell you, the problem we run into is if these things get out of balance. Let me tell you some issues we do. This is why this role is so important. Now the person is no longer just a data entry clerk. Who are they? They're an information accuracy expert. <laughs> okay? They get a sense of pride behind what they're doing. And so what happens is their work performance goes up. Because when I talk about game changers, I am not talking about superstar, superstar salespeople. I'm not talking about division leaders. I'm talking about the person who answers your telephone. You cannot have the two ladies who answer the phones at Steverson and Company. I will hunt you down if you try to hire them. They are game changers. They are game changers because of who they are and the way they interact with clients. We have clients calling us up thanking us for the way that they answer the telephone. It's amazing. It's about who the person is and what they're involved with. The why is critical with what we're dealing with. It's critical that we connect them from the start. When, do we, when, does, it, when does somebody start working for us? From the interview. Possibly from the interview, okay. That's a, you know, it's, it's the atmosphere we, we, we connect. I, I used to think of start date was the day they walked in the door. The problem we have is that's too late in the game. It's too late in the game. So it's from the time that we've extended an offer to them, we need to be moving into engaging that person into our corporate culture. And there's little things that you can do. And I'm telling you, um, I'll quote Ben Metter on this one, uh, who's the chairman of the Metter Companies. He believes, and the reason I say this is I'm not a very good prognosticator. I'm, telling you what the, I'm not a soothsayer, I can't tell you what the future holds. 
you know, the last time I said we weren't going to go into recession, we had a uh, economic global melt meltdown, uh, subprime uh, happened, and the price of oil fell from $120 to $60 in 47 days. And so I figured God was just using me to teach me a lesson. I'm sorry, I caused the calamity we had, so I won't do it again. Ben was explaining to me what he's seeing happening right now is that with current um, trends, uh, that with probably he's thinking within the next year to two years, we're going to be in an amazing employment shortage of, of talent. I mean, he really, he really believes that. Uh, and he's got a pretty, pretty broad scope of what he, a, a vision of what he sees. He's been pretty accurate in the past in conversation. And it has to do with we've got this pent up stuff that's been happening. And it's trying to release. And man, when it releases, it's going to be Katie bar the door. Especially for those of us who have small businesses that, you know, you have 5, 10, 15 employees. I mean, the two to three people has a huge impact on your company. So we've got to be able to look for people who, who want to really engage and really fire off. Uh, and we've got to make sure we hang on to them. Little, little tips of what we can do. Um, when you, if, if for those employees who get business cards, don't wait until they show up to give them business cards. More importantly, have them there the, the, the first day they walk in. Don't make them wait a month before you give them business cards. And if you really want to help out is that send the business cards to them at their home before they start working for you. You know, one of the things that we started doing a while back that the, the feedback we've got from our, our, our staff that we've done this with is we will uh, uh, deliver a um, gift card to one of the local restaurants. It says, uh, take your family out to dinner to celebrate your new career at Stevenson. And uh, Joe Paleo, one of the top financial recruiters out of San Francisco, uses this when he's putting top financial people in, in companies uh, in Silicon Valley. It's, it's the impact. I mean, look at it this way. They may, not take, they may take the wife, they may take the kids, they may take another couple out. Now they're taking them out to dinner. Their dinner, they pull out the gift card. What are they talking about? This is my new company. This is where I'm going. I, anything we can do special is critical. Anything we can do special is important for us to be involved with. Um, Oh, yeah, I, knew, I want to make sure, because this, this is pretty cool. Um, we talked about the ability to navigate, looking for people who, and trying to help people, uh, to, uh, finding people who have the ability to navigate to solve problems. Um, when you bring people on board, is try to look for people that you can line them up to say, here are the go-to people to solve problems for you. Spend time saying, okay, we, you know, here's the controller of our company, our bookkeeper. Uh, the person who's in charge of inventory. Here's a vendor that we have who takes care of all of our graphics. All right? This is what I want you to get involved with. All right? I'm sorry, he's taking my picture over here. <laughs> well, <taking> okay. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's looking for, it's helping people set people up from, from a navigation standpoint to, so they've got the tools and resources, the tools and resources that they need. Here, here's what's wild, okay? Um, I'm a trainer. It's what I do. Uh, it's, I'm, if you haven't figured, I'm passionate about it. In my company, for clients. Uh, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I said, why do you say training is overrated? It's because when I was talking to Judd Grady, he said, Mike, training is overrated for the top performers. For the top performers. And here's why. And I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been thinking about this a lot. We hire people. And we, we make them, we bring them on board, and, and, and think back on the people who have not worked out in your organization in the last two years, two to three years. Think of the person who said that the reason that they failed is because they weren't properly trained. Whose fault was that? Was that, and it, I've really spent, spent time, some time thinking about this, right? Is that we've got a young man that we've hired recently, we've given him this much training, and you know what? He's producing this much. And the reason why is because he's looking for what he needs. And when he doesn't, he, he goes and he finds what he needs. Now, it may, what he needs may be to come and ask me a question. It may be to go and find, I need some help with this. But he goes and finds what he needs. The people who complain that they're not getting enough training are the people who fall in the camp of victimization. If, if what she's saying is that if I don't know why, all right, then what happens, I, I won't have the ability to maybe give back in the form of doing process improvement or what have you. Critical observation. 
critical observations. I mean, all these things are, I mean, bullseye right on target. It's what I've learned, again, in the last year uh, as a teacher, as a trainer, is that I have to spend, how much time have we spent talking about why we do things so far as much as the how? We just spend about 75% of our time talking about why we do things because it makes the how easier to be understood. It gets the commitment and the buy-in and the tie-in as, you're, as you're, all of you are pointing out so, so accurately. That's where the person gets engaged and gets, I mean, if, if somebody, is you're asking somebody to do data entry, it's a totally different process than if you said, let me explain to you the importance of the records we're trying to keep and what's involved with. Let me tell you, the problem we run into is if these things get out of balance. Let me tell you some issues we do. This is why this role is so important. Now the person is no longer just a data entry clerk. Who are they? They're an information accuracy expert. <laughs> okay? They get a sense of pride behind what they're doing. And so what happens is their work performance goes up. Because when I talk about game changers, I am not talking about superstar, superstar salespeople. I'm not talking about division leaders. I'm talking about the person who answers your telephone. You cannot have the two ladies saying that they're not getting enough training are the people who fall in the camp of victimization. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't train. I think that training is essential for getting people onboarded properly. But I think that there has to be a balance involved with that in the people that we select and what we expect of them. And the reason for that is what we want to do is we want to ask people, when we bring them on board, to step up. All right? Step up. For those of you in Rob Pennington's thing this morning, whatever he talks about his next book, this is on my list because it's something that I've got a blog that I write about. It's, uh, it's, we, it's an, it, if we want to get to where we want to be in life, we have to have the ability to step up. We need to surround ourselves with people who want to step up. It's a critical part of what success is going to be about. And so when we're hiring new people in the organization, we want to hire people who we give them this much training and they will step up to make this much happen. That's what we're looking for. Um, so here's, here's the issue. We've talked about selection. We've talked about onboarding. With the few minutes that we've got left, about 15 minutes, it's, we have to stop and look in the mirror for just a second. We've got to. Because it's our ability as leaders to engage people to us, to connect people. And what happens is we make so many mistakes where we disengage and we disconnect. Do we hide behind technology? All right. Now what I mean by that is I'm going to ask you to, to go back, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands with this, but how often do we communicate with our staff by email? And the person is, I'm not even going to say around the corner, they're in the cubicle next to us, and we're emailing them. All right? And we're trying to resolve a problem. Somebody sends something to us, and we're frustrated, so we email them back. And, they, and so you've got this, this email argument that's going on. And all email should be is a transfer of information. That's all email should be. It should not be problem resolution. But what happens is we hide behind, well, we hide behind technology in this process. Uh, now, I need to explain something to you. I am not, I am not anti-technology. I, I mean, we own a software company, for God's sake. <laughs> All right? And I mean, it's, 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 it's moving. It's, it's exciting. I mean, it, and it's, it's, it's taken off. It's, you're going to hear more. It's, I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's cool. I'm, 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 I'm part of a software company. Not only that, but it's like, I got, a, I got a, a MacBook over here. This thing's parsed. I run Macintosh, and I got Windows I, on the other side of it. I, I got, I got a, an iPad. Not, I, I, not only do I have an iPad, I got an iPad 2. And I can't wait to take that iPad 2 and send it to my, my, my stepdaughter's friend in Cambodia because I want the iPad. You know, it's the new one that's coming out, right? Because I got an iPhone, and I got the new iPhone. Tommy doesn't have the new iPhone. I got the new iPhone. I'm so excited. There, there's, a, there's an app on that. It's like I'm so connected to this bad boy. It's like when, when a, an email goes off, I got an app on this thing that sends an electronic shock down my leg that's just on this side of an electric chair. I mean, it's... <laughs> you know, I told that somebody, the guy in the back of the room goes, where's that app? Where's that app? Okay. I mean, there's an app for those things. All right? So I'm not anti... -bit. Let me kind of tell you the problem we have with email as, as a connection tool. And... It was taught to me by my daughter. Is one Christmas, she's at her mom's house, 
And I get this, this text that comes in, hey, Dad, what are you doing? And so I'm wrapping cre- presents on the Christmas, around the Christmas tree. So I get the, my, little, my, my, my black bear, and I'm, I'm pushing it around. So I'm texting her back, and she's texting me, and I'm texting her. And, you know, I'm, and in my mind, I'm going, why did she just call me? <laughs> All right? But no, it's text back, text back. And so this went on for five, six, seven minutes. So good night, I'll, I'll see you next week. Next week, she shows up, and she's got a sleepover with two of her friends. And they're in the living room, you know, with you know, high school girls, and they're sitting down there and they're having a little slumber party thing, and I'm in the kitchen, you know, fixing some snacks for them. And I can hear Nikki in the, in the other room. And I hear her talking about this amazing conversation she had had with her dad just a couple weeks ago. And I'm going. And I started thinking about it. And at first I'm going, that was not a conversation. Until it hit me. It was all the time that I spent with Nikki sitting on the couch talking to her about the things that were important to her. It was the time that I took her at, that she still talks about, when I think she was like nine or ten years old, and we had a date. And I went and I picked her up, I pulled out of the the driveway, pulled up to the front door, had my coat and tie on, rang the doorbell, she came down the stairs, I had the flowers, we got in the car, and went to see the little princess play up at Willowbrook Mall or something. She still talks about that day. it's, It's those times where we interact with people that make those texts, those emails come to life. But we hide behind technology and we don't invest time. And I'm not talking about taking somebody to dinner or taking one of your employees to see the little princess. I'm talking about five minutes at the water cooler. All right? I'm talking about coming in and walking over the desk and knowing that their daughter had a play this week and they were involved with it and say, hey, how was Sally's play? It's those times we spend there makes those messages pop to life. But we don't. And we hide behind technology. Uh, today's response time, here's what's wild, is that uh, voicemail, uh, about two days. Email, uh, they say that it's roughly a, about a day, day and a half. Text messages is 27 minutes. Use the technology to interact, but don't rely on it. Do you focus your attention on them? Uh, Here's a mistake we make. I, was, we, I had a consulting project with Duke Energy Fuel Services, and Tommy and I were interviewing this lady. <laughs> she's sitting, accounting person, she's sitting at a keyboard, and as people were walking into the office, the complaint that the staff had about her is when they walked in, she was multitasking. So she would walk, they would walk in the office, and she's at the keyboard, and she's talking and answering their question. And the next person would come in, and she was never, and she was extremely efficient with what she was doing. But there's a word that's missing from this equation. It's, a, engaged. it's engaged and it's the word effective. She was efficient, but she wasn't effective. And what happens is as leaders of organizations, we have to be able to send a message to our people, I'm focusing my attention on you. You are important to me. What you're dealing with right now, I will stop and interact with you. And I'm telling you, as business owners of small to medium sized businesses or even large businesses, the challenge we have is we're pulled in so many directions. But it's our ability to stop and spend that minute to two minutes to three minutes to interact with those employees that really make them feel a part of what we're involved with. Yes? That's what the average is or is that what the accepted? That's, that's the reality. And the reason I put it up there is because I was, until recently, was pretty anti-text. I hated text. I just, I'll fess up on myself. And, uh, I didn't, you know, I just, but it's, it's becoming an, an accepted means of communication. It just is. It, it, it's, it's surpassing email. Text is. And so, with the younger, it, with the younger generation, they sure. Protect, they don't protect my email. That's it. And my daughter, it's, if I want my daughter, right, I, I have to text her to say, call me. Because if I leave her a voicemail, she ain't calling me back because she doesn't know what's sitting there. Because she doesn't check her, and she doesn't. But it's, it's not just a generational thing. Because what you're finding is that I'm getting pretty good at texting now, right? And I ain't 12 anymore, <laughs> okay? And so what's happening, it's becoming very much an accepted form of communication. But the message that we have as we're walking out of here is that it's so important to us is, is what do we do in between the texts and the emails as we interact with them? That's, that's the message. That's what are we doing to interact with our people and so that that is not... That's something 
something that I've noticed too, that if you had a personal face-to-face -face interaction with somebody recently, not somebody that you work with on a continuous all the time basis, but you know, upper level people, and then you get an email or a text message, you carry, if there was a negative tone in that last face-to-face -face conversation, you still have that negative tone in your mind mm -hmm. in these texts, and you take things wrong right. in emails and text messages. Can I, can I put a positive spin on that, though? Yeah. You did, that's a very accurate statement you just made. Here's what I've learned, is that if I want to interact with somebody and all I'm doing is sending it by email, there's no voice. Yeah. The voice is My theirs. There's, no, Th there's no voice. And what happens is, if what I do is if I call, even <laughs> if I'm leaving a message, now when I read the email, I'm hearing the person's voice as I'm, as I'm reading their email. So now I, I put their, their person in there. So that's why it's important. There was another hand up here. Well, I was just going to say that what you said about be effective, not be sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, because I have a lot of young people that I work with. I just had a, a conversation with an artist who doesn't understand why he can't be on Facebook and personal email all day long to get the job done that he feels like is the end all, be all job for that day. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And this is the message, and it's, I'm being asked more. I'm supposed to speak to the Institute of Management Accountants um, in San Antonio, their National Youth Leadership Program, and uh, uh, with college leaders from around the country. And, and that's a topic that, that they specifically want to address. It's a struggle to keep people, to keep employees successful in the job because of the difference. Because of the and and, 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 and we're, we're drifting at something I think that's an important thing for us to take a moment and look at it has to do with we're talking about generational generational differences but gang here's the reality is that we have a younger force workforce we're supposed to interact with we have to interact with because that's really where the future of our com country company companies come from um, we have a responsibility to help them grow in that area and so what happened we can't say don't do this or do this you have to create opportunities that causes social interaction inside your company or between the person and the client so that they grow because the more that they grow and the more they become comfortable in that area, the more that they will become productive in that area. You know, Tommy pointed out to me, with, I, I, my, my daughter Nikki is pretty verbal, okay, well, excuse me, my daughter Nikki is extremely verbal, okay, but when she pointed, and I, did, I didn't do this intentionally, I wish I could take credit for it, but when she was like this little, it, it's, she would, I would have her if, if she said, you know, we needed a, a, a phone number from information, I'd say, Nikki, call information and get the phone number for me. <laughs> Made her get on the phone. And she, I mean, how safe is that? It's, it's, real, it's real safe, you know. But it's, if we have to find little, th and so what happens is now she's a senior in college and she's running her own life and she's doing her own thing and uh, there's a comfort in, in that area. What happens is we try to protect our children, we try to protect our staff, we try to protect ourselves as opposed, instead of creating environments. It's one of our, 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 our staff who works at the front desk, Latoya, is amazing. And one of the things she's uncomfortable doing uh, is speaking in front of people, in front, in front of groups. Uh, here's the reality. She's good at doing it. She's just uncomfortable doing it. So we have her do presentations in our office and we look for things. And so. If you're looking for people on your staff to grow in this area, you create opportunities for them to be able to, to, to flex their, their muscles. So, um, it, as we're interacting with our staff, Patrick uh, Oxford, the chairman of Bracewell and Giuliani, uh, and you gotta understand, Bracewell and Giuliani, for those who don't recognize the name, it's one of the top litigation firms in the world. I mean, this is, this is like, they hired the best of the best lawyers. And I thought that when I asked him, he says, what is it that makes your organization stand out or that, that it's important to your people? He said this. He said, it's our ability to listen. And he went on to say, it's not, it's, it, it's not what you say. It's what you hear that's the glue. It's not what you tell the person. It's what you hear them selling you. That's the glue that keeps them connected to your organization. Uh, career best effort. I don't have time for this. No, we don't. Okay. Yeah, we'll end with this. This is Jamie Root. Uh, Houston, I, got, I want to end with the Houston Texans. And the reason why I say that it has to do with our ability to create memorable moments. This, this is their acrostic. If you look at the, the, the Texans, 
uh, what they stand for is impact. Innovation, memorable moments, passionate, accountable, courage, team player. The memorable moments is the thing that stood out in my mind when I was talking to him. What is this memorable moments thing? He said organization is not a football team. Organization is designed to create memorable moments for people to come here with their families and their children. And that's what the Texans are all about. And what happens is we don't spend enough time creating memorable moments inside our company for our teams and our staff and the people that we interact with. And there's little things that we can do. Um, when I was talking to him, he told me about a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I had read it in college, but I went out and got it because I was looking for a way to close a speech and I wanted to use something that was a, just a great idea. Vic, Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and it's, this book is considered to be one of the most uh, influential books of the 20th century. Uh, it's phenomenal. It talks about why did some people survive the Holocaust and why you know, others didn't. And it was the people had meaning in life, something that they had a purpose, which of course is what we're talking about, is people who work for us have a purpose for, for, for what they're doing. Uh, and so what I got, I went, I got the book and I read it, and what I did is I had Latari take a picture of me reading the book, and I took it and I put it on a card, and I mailed the card to Jamie and signed it and said, thanks for sharing this with me. Your words are gonna have huge impact on people. And the reason this stood out for me was about four months later, I got a phone call from Jamie's assistant saying, hey, Jamie wants to know if you'd like to go to one of the Texans football games. And I went, cool. So I went home and I said, Tommy, hey, we got invited to the Texas football game. She goes, really? By who? I said, the president of Texas. She goes, really? She goes, uh, yeah, he invited us to sit in the president's box. She goes, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so we, it's, it's, the card became a memorable moment, the way of interacting. And, and it's, it, it's not the big stuff that we do. You know, it's the little stuff that we do. That's another thing. I've got some things on the back over there if you want to throw some cards in there that talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's some things that I do to help follow up and to be able to connect with both not only staff, with clients and stuff as far as uh, 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 car, uh, card stuff I'm involved with. Uh, there's some things on, if you have an interest in assessments, throw your card in that. I've kind of dissected out that, that, that there's something that you're specifically interested in. And then also, uh, we're, uh, we were involved in coaching and counseling, and so if you've got some things that, you have to, that you're interested in from an HR standpoint, recruiting standpoint, or business owner standpoint, I'd be more than happy to work with you. Um, I, 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 I'm gonna have to skip through this because this has to do with, um, I, I, got, I got in with this. It's, She's gonna fuss at me. Okay, I'm gonna do this in three minutes. Okay. Because um, this is my paycheck. This is what I get to talk about. This is what I believe strongly in. It's about hope. It's the reason I do this. It's I think that as business owners and business leaders, our job is to create hope for the people who work around us. It's what separates things. It's, it's the hope that we bring into our organizations. All right? It's, it's the, the belief that there's something special that's out there. You know, my daughter and I got a chance to experience that when Nikki was six years old and she came down, bounding down the stairs with little pigtails in her head and she says, I know what I want for Christmas. And I'm going to dad who's, why God tell me what it is, I'll get it for you. And she goes, I want a Pokemon snow globe. <laughs> and I'm going, not a problem, I'll make that happen. And her mom is behind her going. And so I went, okay. Why do you want a Pokemon snow globe? She goes, because they don't make them. <laughs> and if I get a Pokemon snow globe, it means that there is a Santa. And I'm going, <sighs> okay, okay. Now this is the same child that came in uh, asking for a, uh, a Mercedes car that she saw in a magazine. And I tried to explain to her using logic that Santa can't bring that to you because it costs $8,000. And she says, no, it's free, the elves make it. And that didn't work, so then I went to the stage of saying, well, it's too big to put in the sleigh, so if you put it in the sleigh, then there's not room for all the other toys for all the little boys and girls, and she goes, Santa can make two trips. Okay, I mean, I got a kid who deals with logic. Right? This is on her mind. Um, I find out that Michaels makes a snow globe kit. And so I go down, I buy a snow globe kit. 
And I spend nights up. I get a little, matter of fact, when I go, went, went to buy the kit, I go blowing in the door and there's this, this wonderful woman who's at the counter. I go walk in and I said, I'm here, I called you about the snow globe kit. She goes, come with me. She takes me over, gives me the snow globe kit, finds the key ring with the pokey, a little Pokemon figurines on the little key rings. And she says, if you take this and cut the key thing off, you can put it inside, it'll be perfect for you. I'm like, cool. She took me to the checkout counter. There's two ladies at the checkout counter. She went walking in. She literally pushed them out the way and said, get out of my way. This man is saving Santa Claus. <laughs> I go home and I bake that little Pokemon little thing in there and I put it down there. And, and a matter of fact, I made three of them. And so when Nikki came down, Christmas morning came blowing down the stairs, she comes flying in there. And she goes past the karaoke machine that we had bought and all the other things that, that a, a, a single child should not get and stuff. And as we have these three things, and she goes blowing in and she sees these snow globes and she picks them up and she's going, there is a Santa! <laughs> the reason I share this with you is one. It, it, it's our job is to create an atmosphere of possibility of what can possibly be out there for the people that work with us if they have passion for what they do, if they throw their heart into it, if they feel connected to who they are, to who we are, if they feel a, a sense of importance. Our job is to select, to engage, and then turn them loose and get them out the way. It's been a pleasure sharing with you. Thank you very much. Celebrate your life.